Hi, everyone. We're Hi everybody. back here at the Center for the Arts with November's artist. That's David Becker. David is uh, from the North Side, but you're an old Chicago person, is that correct? Grew yes. up in Chicago? Yes, grew up in Chicago uh, near Wrigley Field. Oh, yeah, right oh around the Wrigley okay. Field area. Well, I noticed on uh, your moniker here it says illustrator, instructor, and fine artist. How do you become a fine artist? And what is a fine artist? <laughs> well, the illustrator part is easy because I just worked for an advertising agency, but the fine artist was just to do the paintings that you're going to be seeing. So the illustrating, I guess, illustrations are for, you know, selling something. Where here, the fine art is just hopefully for, a, art. for art and to have people see the painting and be pleased by, I guess, the painting. Well, you've written a couple of books. Tell me a little bit about those books that you wrote. And what, what was your theme with them? Uh, that was to, I also teach. I'm an I'm a instructor and do workshops around the country. And um, the books were to hopefully get people to see that I know how to teach and mm -hmm. <laughs> how to show people how to paint these kind of pictures, watercolors. And um, did those right out of school, taught right out of school. And that's what I thought I was going to be doing at first, but then I went into illustration instead. And now going into fine art. <laughs> so. Well, tell us, your illustrations, as we're standing in front of a couple of them now, um, it's interesting to uh, how you um, do this. Um, yeah, these, um, the ones I see right here, are more of the, um, the ones I teach and I demonstrate in front of audiences. And then as we go around later, you'll see the ones I do in my studio. So mm -hmm. there's a difference between these and this couple So of you're ones. talking and painting at the same yeah. time, showing your students. Yes. And a lot of these the are also methods. done while I'm doing a, in, in a workshop where I'm actually with the students to show them how to actually do the painting. This one behind it was done in a demonstration up in Woodstock. It was just um, a place mm -hmm. in Woodstock that I did for a bunch of, a group of artists and just did it in front. And you, these usually don't take as long as like the studio ones. Mm -hmm. These take about an hour or so for the demonstrations. The but other ones are more concentrated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, more concentrated. Well, you, you were a student. We'll walk over this way as we look at some other works here. You were a student at uh, one of the schools, and you were also teaching. So how, how did it feel being a student with everybody, and yet you turn around and you wind up teaching the same kids that you're working with? Well, I had a great instructor, and his name was Erwin Shapiro at the American Academy of Art. And um, he was a wonderful instructor. And actually, I wanted to teach right out of school. And he actually told me, go see the world first <laughs> and then come on back. And while you're doing that, um, I'll give you my demonstration. I'll let you um, substitute when he was on the workshops and stuff. And so he let, let me teach right out of school. So it was actually very fun teaching. And though he, one time I had done a, a workshop or a class for one of his students, but they were the same age as I was. So that was really kind of interesting because it was like I wasn't that much older than they were. So, but it teaches you a lot to actually when you actually teach, it actually teaches you more than actually when you're taking a class because you have to know all the answers to all the questions that everybody's going to ask you. So it really helps to teach when you're... But maybe the, ins the students enjoyed you. That yeah, you think, weren't older than they were. You know, they, they felt more comfortable. Yeah, they had to prove yourself. You have to, yeah. have to prove yourself that you could do it. And then when mm -hmm. I did a demonstration and they saw I did it in an hour, mm -hmm. then they all of a sudden they were like, ooh, they're very interested. So it was very cool. Well, painting quickly is, is I well, can't imagine see. how you can do that because you, you get the rendering so much. Tell us a little bit about some of the drawings that you have here. A lot of Chicago. Yeah, that's because yeah, I always tell my students to draw what you know and what you paint, what you know. And I know Chicago really well. I've worked downtown for 37 years. And um, now I live up in the Channel Lakes area. Mm -hmm. But um, these are my, this is my path I take to the train every day. So I just walk down the street and a I familiar have a sight to you. Very, very familiar. And so I paint what I see and what I know. And I love, I live in an area where there's a lot of boating. So mm -hmm. I love boating, I love water, I love rainy scenes, I love city scenes. And so Chicago is one of those, and Venice is another one of those. I mean, Venice is wonderful. It's got buildings, boats, water, yes. everything I love to paint. So it's just paint what you love. Have you gone to Venice often, or did you no, want to? One, one trip? Last year. So you took a lot of pictures with your camera, I'm sure, uh, to try to remember. Yeah. <laughs> 1,300 pictures. Wow. And so, yeah, it was just, um, Venice was wonderful. I did a workshop there, again, I could teaching. see why you would have chosen Venice, though, because it has an artistic way. I mean, there's so much there that you could 
paint that would be very nice oh, to yeah, look it's, at. It's beautiful. Did you paint while you were there too? Did you set up like oh, yeah. I used to see some people we in been the to streets? Venice, yes. In the streets, and did you hang your works? Ask to see if you could sell some. <laughs> well, you're on the street, and I'm teaching because I went there to teach a workshop there, and so you have a, a bunch of students behind you, mm -hmm. and they're also painting. So the people come up and just watch you and to ask you questions, and of course, yeah, you'll sell them <laughs> if they if they're the right price. You know, sure. Well, I find this very interesting, and it's lovely. This is something a little bit different. Um, I, um, since um, about a year ago, I decided, you know, not everybody needs a painting on their wall, but everybody has furniture in their house. So I decided to put my, my watercolors onto the furniture. And, um, and nowadays, it's sort of like something a little bit different, just something a little different. Then you don't have to worry about what, can I, what kind of <laughs> trinket can I put on this table? You don't have to worry about it. It's all done for you in well, a you, beautiful painting. You've won many awards, a lot of accolades, uh, many of them. In fact, can you tell me maybe the top one or two that made most impression or you were most proud of? Um, I think the one, um, there's a lot of watercolor societies out there. Like there's the Midwest, uh, the National Watercolor Society, the American Watercolor Society. And the TWSA is one that was started here in the Midwest. The MWSA, now they're called TWSA, the Transparent Watercolor Society of America. And when I got my letters, you, um, some of the paintings will have my letter TWSA behind it, and that's the Transparent Watercolor Society of America. And you just have to get accepted into a couple shows, like three shows to get accepted and get your name. So now I'm a life member of them, but that was one of the final awards. You know, that next is going to be try, try to be the NWS and then the AWS, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's amazing just, just to see your colors here. And, and uh, something here you told us about, this is, uh, takes a little more time to do than when you demonstrate doing a painting in 20 minutes. You yes, can put yes. something on the canvas. W what's the huge difference here? The detailed work? Yeah, for one, I work on different kind of papers and stuff, and then the stuff on the tables. The tables are actually painted first with a with a ground, and I paint right on top of that. Um, the demonstrations are done on a, on a very rough paper called Arches Rough, and um, and then this the paintings in my studio I do I do them on Bristol board, which is a very slick surface, and um, it takes a little bit more time, but the, the potency of the um, paint that comes out is just beautiful. So that's like my way it in is my older. studio. It's just, they pop a little bit, the colors pop a little bit more, you know, there's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit harder to work with, and that's why I don't teach that on, on the yeah. kind of board, but um, you can just see there's just difference you in know, the tightness. When I look at these finished ones, you kind of fall into the picture. You know, you kind of feel like you're, <laughs> you're there almost. I mean, they're, they're really, they come out to you. Yeah, they're, they're fun, I mean, it's just really, and they're actually fun to do. And when I do them, I don't, I don't do work on one at, one at a time. I usually, oh. when I um, work, because a lot of times with watercolor, there's a lot of waiting game because you wait for something to dry to do your next wash. So I'll work on two or three at a time, and I'll just set them all up in a row, and I'll start on one. And I just get, when you get to that one, and that one starts to dry, then you go over this one. There's nothing worse than waiting <laughs> for oh, paint wow. to dry, <laughs> watching paint water dry. So you, <laughs> you utilize your time efficiently. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, uh, we're just about out of time. What is uh, on the agenda for you, David, in the next six months to a year? Anything spectacular that you're looking forward to or are you going to be involved in? Um, I think mostly is going to be doing um, the fine art. I've been illustrating now for 37 years, and now it's time to start doing the fine art and start doing the finished illustration, or not the finished illustration, but the finished artwork, mm -hmm. like you see behind you. I'm going to try to do one a day is what my goal is. Really? <laughs> one a day, one of these paintings a day, and we'll see how that goes. Does it relax you when you're painting? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes, so absolutely. it's a nice... It's just, uh, you're in heaven when you're sitting there and you're just painting, got the music playing in the background, and... It's just wonderful. It sounds wonderful. Yes, <laughs> it does. Well, come on out and see David Becker's works. He's yes. uh, a Chicago boy. Uh, he does some beautiful things about Chicago. You can see some of these works, and you can kind of guess before you read where it's at, where Chicago is. It looks familiar. You Wacker see familiar and Wells scenes. and Lake Street. So come on out. Uh, his, uh, going to have uh, refreshments on the 14th of November from 7 to 9 here at the uh, Center for the Arts, and um, I ask you if you could, would you do a painting for us that day that a you're demonstration. here? A little demonstration. A demonstration. So come on out and see David and actually and see, learn him, something. <laughs> see him at his best. We'll be right back.
Hello, this is Lieutenant Jeff Pluta from the Addison Fire Protection District. The kitchen is the heart of the home, especially at Thanksgiving. As your family and friends gather to celebrate and give thanks, please remember safety is important to help you enjoy this special day. Thanksgiving is the leading day of the year for home fires that involve cooking equipment. When cooking on the stovetop, make sure you stay in the kitchen to monitor the cooking. Stay in your home when cooking your turkey and make sure you check it frequently. Even running a quick errand while the oven is on can cause disaster. Kids love to help with cooking, but please be sure we keep safety in mind, especially in the hectic preparations for a big meal. Keep kids at least three feet away from the hot stove and away from hot foods and liquids. One more important point, make sure your smoke and carbon monoxide detectors are working. Test them before the big day. This will ensure that any problems are found before they become a disaster. By following these simple tips, we can all ensure that today is truly a day we can be thankful for. From the members of the Addison Fire Protection District, please have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Hi, I'm John Kokoris, Community Services Coordinator here at Addison Public Library, and uh, I'm with my buddy Jack Bauer. He's our Digital Services Coordinator, and he's um, kind of coming up with a lot of new technology offerings for the people of Addison. So, um, Jack, why don't you tell us um, your newest uh, program here at the library? Well, first off, um, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for uh, having me on to show off uh, all this cool stuff that we check out. Um, now, we check these things out for about a week to our patrons, um, and a lot of them are a little more expensive than uh, what they would typically like to pay for, uh -huh. um, especially for the amount that they're using it. It's really only every so often, so we figured why not just check this stuff out and then maybe they can... So uh, the stuff you're about to show us, people can take home with them, you're saying? Oh, yeah. All right, well, what is, what is it we actually have? Well, first we have um, these external hard drives. Um, these have about 500 gigabytes of storage, so they're rather large. Oh, so that's, yeah, that's big enough for like a video or... Yeah, and that's the idea when we have um, people working on video projects here, maybe recording music. Um, sometimes they need more space than just a flash drive while they're working on it with all the different components and video. So we offer these and they can uh, bring it back and forth. You don't save on our computers here. So right. we decided to have something uh, a little bigger for them to bring back and forth. Um, okay. So yeah, they can check one of those out. Um, What's this over here? This is an audio, uh, a digital audio recorder. Um, so if we have anyone interested in making music, recording live music, or uh, some sort of radio podcast or something okay. like that. Okay, so if you wanted to, say, interview someone, you could use that. Exactly, we could maybe okay. even use this right now. So it's basically just a microphone with a recorder. Yeah, it. Um, and it, it fits uh, a significant amount of time on here, um, and it's it's very high quality recording, too. Okay, cool. Yeah. What if, uh, say, I w that sounds cool, but most people probably want to record video now that that's feasible. Is there any way to do that? It's actually a great question, you're in luck. Um, because the next thing, I, even the next thing I wanted to show off was uh, this digital camcorder. Ah. So this is a, as you can see, it's really compact. Mm -hmm. um, it's really lightweight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people uh, can't afford these, especially for the amount they use Yeah, it. if you like, only want to use it once or twice a year, yeah, it's not really yeah. worth buying it. Like maybe a sports game for your child yeah. or graduation or a family party. Really these special occasions you're using it for. Um, it's really easy to use. It's got this screen right here to view. Mm -hmm. um, there it goes, it just turned on. Um, and it's got pretty good battery life and it shoots cool. pretty high quality video. Yeah, I was going to say, it says HD on the side. You're not telling me that this is a, like a high definition. Yeah, camcorder. this little thing actually is. Um, wow. It's, it's quite a powerful device. It's got a pretty nice zoom too, so you can uh, get the touch down. Or, yeah, um, yeah, it says 57 times. Yeah. You can get 57 times closer. Um, wow. That might be true, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really a pretty cool, handy device. Yeah, do we have any other camera equipment? Yeah, actually, um, it's checked out right now, uh, but we have a GoPro, which is a little bit more of an extreme version of this. Uh, it's a lot smaller, and uh -huh. we have like a head mount for it. Um, oh, okay. And so people can kind of take that bike riding or maybe uh, hiking or something, and it, yeah. it's a very good picture quality as well. Okay, wow, so you can just strap that to your head and like start taping. Yeah, yes. Very neat. All right, well, we got a few other things now. I'll move these aside, actually. These are more for uh, some of our teenagers or 
younger people that come to the library. Uh -huh. so this is a little abstract right now, but this is um, what's called an Arduino set. Uh -huh. um, and this is kind of like a circuit board that they can program different lights to go off, different buzzers to go off. It's mm -hmm. kind of getting kids into robotics and programming and stuff like that. So huh. uh, we have programs on this semi-regularly. Like and, classes, uh, you mean? Yeah, classes. All right, nice. And so if they're interested in uh, learning more, taking it home, um, we have this available for them. Cool. And then what's that thing over there? This is kind of uh, the piece de resistance. Um, oh, wow. This is Lego Mindstorm. Uh, this is basically Lego robotics. Um, and you can build all of these different kinds of Lego sets. Uh -huh. And there are all different kinds of robots you can make. So let me just demo this one. This is one our teen librarian built for us. Let's see here. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't run off the edge of the table. Yeah, I think it is. Well, that's really cool. So that's so anyone can check this out, but it's kind of geared more probably towards teens and like young adults. Yeah. And you don't have to build this necessarily. No, you yeah. Like you can look online. There's tons of different things people make with this. It's another great way for kids to uh, get into learning more about robots. And uh, of course, they like Legos already. So it's, it's definitely something uh, I think our, our patrons are interested in. Yeah, very cool. Um, and I assume since we're just getting started with all this, if people have ideas, can they give you a call or? Yeah, of course. They could always uh, contact me at bower at addisonlibrary.org. That's B-O-W at addisonlibrary.org if they have suggestions. Um, or just really mention it to anyone who works here. It would eventually get, get back around to me. OK, um, any plans to like continue? Do you have any new ideas? or? Um, well, we, we're always. Uh, considering more things. Right now, we, we have a number of things. And, and I should say, too, just so people at home know, um, anything, any project you're working on with this equipment, you can c bring into the library, right? And, and work yeah, using our computers. Yeah, yeah. We, we're all here to help and uh, show you guys um, how to use our equipment. All right, well, thanks for chatting. Thank you, I had a great time. All right, cool. So I'm just going to run through a few more um, programs that we're offering this month here at the library. I'm going to start with the children's events. We've got our uh, monthly art program, Young Monet's. It's for kids that are three to five years old. Um, it starts at four o'clock, and it's on Wednesday, November 5th. And, um, and this meets every month towards the beginning of the month. We also have Bookamania. It's like a book club for older kids. I think it's grades um, three to five also meets at 4 o'clock on Thursday, um, and it meets the first Thursday of every month, just about. Um, but on the more exciting side of things, we have a world of reptiles coming here on November 12th. And you can get your tickets today by calling the library. Everything is free here, of course. But um, uh, we, we're bringing like a trainer, or I guess not a trainer, more of a collector in. And he's got live specimens, snakes, and everything. Kids can come up and pet. So that, that like fills up really fast, so people will want to call us if they um, are interested in coming. We also have Donut Day on Saturday, November 15th at 2 o'clock. That's, I guess it's National Donut Day, and we're celebrating our favorite uh, breakfast treat with crafts and, of course, snacks. But on the adult side of things, the side that I take care of, um, we've got a lot of uh, educational programs and some more cultural, more fun programs. Um, you can learn how to save energy this Thursday, November 6th at 7. Um, we're having the Citizens Utility Board come out and talk about like some scams that are going on right now and some um, tips on keeping your heating bill down, your electrical bill down this winter. Um, we also have an expert on search engine optimization coming out on November 11th at 7. He's going to help you if you have like a, a personal business or a brick and mortar business, but you have a website and you want to promote it, get it to show up on top of Google, um, you know, as one of the first results. He's going to share some some tricks with us on how to do that. Um, again, more on the fun side of things, we're having a taste of Sicily. We had a taste of Italy a few months ago. It was packed. We have um, a speaker who shares photos and facts about uh, Italy and then recipes on some Italian foods. And it was so popular, we decided to bring her back for more. So she's doing a Taste of Sicily on November 13th at 7. That's a Sunday. Um, on, uh, a few days later, we have video editing. 
it's a class taught actually by Jack, who we, we just spoke with a minute ago. And that's how to kind of take anything that you maybe have filmed and um, kind of put it together, add some music, subtitles, credits, um, cut out the bad parts, things like that. Um, John Pankow, a, a local attorney, is coming to talk about keeping Uncle Sam out of your estate, protecting your assets after, you know, you die. And um, somebody from Bentron Financial Group is coming to talk to us about Social Security um, the next day on November 19th. So um, we've got a pretty busy calendar. After that, we've got plenty of Christmas programs. Um, if you want to know some of our other offerings or if you have any questions, look through the read. It should be hitting your mailbox this week. Or give us a call or check us out online at addisonlibrary.org. Thanks. Hello, this is Lieutenant Jeff Pluto from the Addison Fire Protection District. Nothing beats sitting around a fire with family and friends on a cool fall night. Many residents have outside fire pits and fireplaces and use them responsibly. But please keep the following rules in mind to ensure that you and your neighbors remain safe. You must use an approved metal fire pit or a fire pit made of brick. Burn barrels are not allowed. All fire pits must have an ember arresting mesh cover to prevent flying embers from starting a fire. The fire pit should be located at least 15 feet from any houses, garages, sheds, or any other structures. Federal and state EPA rules forbid the burning of any garbage or yard waste. Leaves, brush, weeds, green wood, pine needles, construction lumber of any type, paper, or any type of garbage is not allowed to be burned in a fire pit. Remember, a fire should never be left unattended and a hose must be available and ready for, to use in case of an emergency. And please be aware that these rules apply in both the village of Addison and the surrounding unincorporated areas. Hi everyone, we're back at Addison Trail High School. We're celebrating, celebrating the 20th year of the Tradition of Excellence Award. And for that 20th year, we have businesswoman Cher Pasquini. 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 <laughs> I knew I'd get it right the second time. It's nice to be here. Congratulations, on, yes, congratulations. Uh, on winning the award. Well, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's nice to be back home. Uh, it was uh, when I graduated Addison Trail, I was uh, scooped up and uh, put in a car and driven to Phoenix, Arizona about a week after I graduated. So, you know. That's kind of hard. Oh, absolutely. I would think to have to relocate, everything's changing. Well, I was the um, disco queen back then, so going to country western was not my thing. <laughs> and all your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, of course, I ended up packing up my bags uh, three months later and uh, drove across country and uh, came back home to Addison. I missed it. I, I absolutely love this town. Absolutely. Well, that's nice. It, it really... Um, it's home. It's home. It will always, always be home to me. Well, well far, go ahead. Mm -hmm. you said after a couple of months you packed up and you came home. Well, I came. Did you co go to college here? No, um, I actually went to a college in um, Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. a community college there. And then basically um, about five years there, and then I ended up traveling. I was on Hyatt's opening team. Uh, How did you get on that? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I started, um, I only had one class my last year here at Addison Trail uh, because I was going to summer school every summer oh. from eighth grade on. And so I started working at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare. And when my parents moved to Phoenix, um, I ended up opening up the Hyatt in Phoenix, Arizona. And then they had this college assistance program. I thought, oh, that's good. Um, yeah. And because I was the one paying for college, so I thought that was a, a good opportunity for me. And then about five years working there, um, I continued my education, and I was on Hyatt's opening team. And I ended up taking classes in, in different colleges. That's, excuse me, that's the way I had to do it. Um, but it took me um, until probably three years ago, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, to to finish college uh, because of all the travels, every single yeah, job I, mean, I had. Yeah, I how much can you do and in a day? <laughs> exactly, and you know, at the time, um, you know, they didn't have, uh, nothing was on the internet. Uh, you had yeah. to go to classes, and with the traveling, it was impossible, but finally I got it done. What did you get your degree in? Uh, BS, uh, BA, mm -hmm. uh, in organizational management uh, oh. with uh, um, uh, University of Laverne. 
So mm -hmm. finally, and well, there was the University of Maryland and the <laughs> so yeah. along the way. The but then it's yeah. exactly it exactly. has more color to your character that it wasn't just one big school. See, that's very interesting. Well, absolutely, and you know the thing of it is, is my parents. Uh, you know, my father was 40 when I was born. My mother was 36. And, uh, you know, I just knew early on that both my sister and I did that we had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And we did whatever we needed to do to, mm -hmm. to, to get that done. So, so. You, got a, you got that job. Yeah. And it's finding your earning income. Right. You're still going to school, but it's a hassle for you. Right. Now, from 75 to 95. Take us through those 20 years, which were really monumental in, in your development. Well, the oh. traveling and everything oh. you did. Absolutely. Um, then uh, with Hyatt, you know, I opened up a lot of hotels here. Uh, the Hyatt Minneapolis, Palm Beach, Florida, Baltimore, Maryland, Atlanta, the addition to the Hyatt Regions, uh, Sea Atlanta. Then uh, I ended up uh, moving to L.A. Uh, and then working in hospitality there as well. And then I ended up working, um, going, well, actually getting a job with the United Nations Command for the Department of Defense in Seoul, yeah. South Korea. Wow. And so spent uh, about four years there and just uh, traveling with the United Nations Command. Uh, I was the uh, director of HR and training and development there. And, uh, and then when I got home, uh, my father was sick, so I ended up having to cut my contract short, and he passed away, so I ended up coming home working for AT&T Broadband, and then getting a great job, um, again, as uh, the director, a corporate director of HR and training and development for Lockheed Martin, a PAE company, um, and that was all international. We had about 6,000 employees worldwide traveling to... Uh, that's where a lot of travel came in, uh, from building uh, American embassies in Iraq, uh, and then traveling to Kabul, Sudan, and you name it. Uh, I worked with Lockheed for quite a number of years, and then I transitioned into World Vision International as the International uh, Director of Employee Relations. They didn't have that department, so I opened up that department. Mm -hmm. um, they're a $2.6 billion NGO. They are the largest provider of water throughout the world. And we work a lot with the United Nations. We work um, a lot with, uh, we have support offices all over the world uh, in Australia, Korea, UK. But again, being American, we are the generous, we are such a generous uh, country that um, we give a lot of money and we give the most in this organization. Well, you wonder about the West, rest of the world. You know, they could try to chip in too a little bit, but obviously it's not happening. But 65 countries uh, responsible for 6,000 people. Then you went to 50,000 people on your responsibilities. How does a little girl from Addison yes, achieve from those a kinds small town of goals? Of Addison do that. You know, <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, it's, I just worked. You know, and, you know, you're not even thinking what you're doing and you don't even you just realize do it. you just do it. Mm -hmm. You don't. Uh, I think my parents instilled in me, um, if you're going to do something, do it right or don't do it at all. Yeah. And I just kept marching forward. And, you know, you know, there were, you know, nothing was, you know, there was times that things were not easy. Um, but, um, you know, you just do it. And then one day you turn around and you go, wow, did I do all this? And you just can't believe it yourself. But it's been a, it changes you as a person. Well, it's a learning experience too, being in other countries, I would think. And what you did was not an ordinary job. You didn't say, I'm a secretary or something, not to put down secretaries. Mm -hmm. It was very, it, you were building, mm -hmm. you were putting new departments together. Yes. That's, that takes a lot of thought and know-how, really. Well, I think you had that little chip on your shoulder, too. To, to be able to do what you did in such a short time, it doesn't come easy to a lot of people. Well, I am really proud of what I did uh, with World Vision because it was, uh, there was nothing there. And now what we have is for the employees, uh, if there was something that happened internationally, uh, again, we are in 110 countries, if there was a death, if there was a, a sexual harassment or anything like that, it didn't really come up the chain quickly. So um, when I put this uh, protocol, it was called the Employee Relations Protocol, and it was a code red, code yellow, 
that then we uh, uh, then uh, um, put together a, a software program as well. And now, uh, what I'm proud to say now after you know six years being there, is when something like that happens, a death of an employee or a sexual harassment or something that we need to know, they fill out an electronic form, they press submit, and from attorneys to me to senior leadership, we know it in the time. After they There's submit. notification now, yeah, whereas absolutely. before we swept under the rug or... Right, absolutely. Yeah. And with technology, you're able to communicate a lot quicker. You know, you hear about this right away. Absolutely. Which we, it we should a, be that way. Oh, absolutely. And we have a huge department called Staff Care. And now what's great about it is that we touch so many employees um, faster and quicker, and we have staff care that are um, uh, psychologists and uh, people available to them for help. So that's great. You know, I'm, I'm really proud of that. As a matter of fact, when I went to Geneva, Switzerland, I met with a lot of other NGOs, and the United Nations was there, and they were going around the room asking people what they do, what kind of mechanism do they have in place. Uh, they were blown away by what we had, and we definitely have state-of-the-art uh, as far as the, in the NGO world. Wow. Well, we're just about out of time. What would you tell the students that are you're going to meet uh, in a little while about how to achieve these kinds of goals? And what do you have to do to get there? You know, I think the thing that I, I always tried to find a way around the wall, over the wall, under the wall or through the wall, <laughs> but I found a way in and I just will not give up on my dreams. Um, you know, it's you got to believe in yourself. A lot of people will tell you you can't do something. But you just keep marching forward. And you said earlier, why didn't you notice it? Because I just kept marching forward. Well, I think you're the type of personality when somebody says you can't do it, you said, oh, really? That oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, watch. absolutely. You watch me. That's you right. You watch me. So maybe they do that on purpose to get you going. You wonder, because I think, never tell a child, you'll never be able to do this. You know? <laughs> absolutely. I think that's wrong. And I always say, I got this. Yeah. yeah. Sure, thank you so much, and congratulations on your uh, award and recognition, and we'll be right back.